I'm Steve Clements. I'm with the American Strategy Program here at the New America Foundation. It's great to have all of you with us today uh, for a very exciting program uh, with Eamon Mohadeen. We're going to have a conversation uh, about uh, this, what I've been referring to as this tsunami of its own kind of democracy, dignity, economic movements uh, in the Middle East. And we were just, uh, I was just in Doha for the Al Jazeera Forum and heard uh, the young man to my right just capture this audience and to share with us uh, incredible riveting accounts of his experiences in Tahrir Square uh, in Egypt and elsewhere. He was uh, uh, jailed while there uh, for a day, which is a, quite an emotional experience. I know that when I uh, was thrown in jail once uh, for violations of a jaywalking ticket in Santa Monica, <laughs> it didn't uh, <laughs> resonate the same way uh, that his experience did. Let me tell you a few words about Eamon. <coughs> Uh, Mohadeen, currently a Middle East-based correspondent for Al Jazeera English, uh, based in Egypt right now, where he's been reporting extensively on the revolution that started in January 2011. He was previously based in Gaza and was one of the only international journalists to report from inside Gaza during the Israel war there from 2008 and 2009, uh, for which he was nominated for an international Emmy. Uh, he's also reported on sectarian violence in Lebanon, the Israel-Palestine conflict, human rights abuses in the Gulf and on political and social issues from across the United States. Uh, before joining Al Jazeera English, Eamon was a produ producer with CNN, uh, based for two years in Baghdad. He's basically been everywhere, <laughs> and he's totally cool. And I hadn't really realized it, but when I flew back, I didn't know him that well, and you know, he has a sort of on-stage appearance and look, and then he has this sort of off-stage kind of real <laughs> hip cool look, and he was on my plane. And I saw people just kept coming, streaming by and talking to him. And I actually didn't think it could be the same guy that I've seen in Al Jazeera, but it was. It's so good to have you with it's us good here to today. Be Thank you very uh, much. So, so great. I mean, I, I just basically want to open up and say, what's on your mind right now? Because you've, you've been uh, just in, in the middle of a big storm. You've been reporting it. But, but share, us, share with us where you think, what are the benchmarks now for, for what you think is most important for audiences here uh, to, to think about when looking about change? Uh, I, I've been saying, you know, the, the problem with revolutions traditionally is they don't always go well. Uh, sometimes the people don't win. Uh, but I'd love to hear what you think is going on. Uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for having me here. It's a real honor and privilege to be back at uh, New America Foundation and having uh, such a great uh, crowd. It's always a privilege to come to Washington, D.C. And, and speak directly with uh, as many people uh, as possible and try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, y your question is, uh, is, a, is a trick question. It may not seem like it, but it's a trick question. But the reason why is it, it weighs so heavily on the minds of many people who are journalists, who are American, who are Arabs. Uh, you can look at it from so many different perspectives as to what's happening right now across uh, the Arab world. So what may be on my mind and what I will share with you guys today may not necessarily be what's on my mind if I was speaking to a slightly different audience, but being here in America, there's a great amount of interest what is happening in the United States or what is happening in the Arab world and how this affects the United States and more importantly, what role the United States can play. So I'm personally preoccupied right now with uh, how the United States is going to engage uh, in these new forces that are coming to light in the Arab world. Uh, I can say that I have somewhat been disturbed by sometimes the discourse in this country, particularly about uh, the post-revolutionary atmosphere in countries like Egypt, Tunisia, and more importantly, uh, the discussion about Libya. Uh, I think that right now has been somewhat of uh, a troublesome thought for me because after witnessing Tunisia and Egypt and covering both Tunisia and Egypt, uh, it seems that there are now forces trying to halt the winds of change, if you will, that are sweeping across the region. And that is certainly one of the things that is on my mind, how uh, in terms of what we're witnessing and change in the country, uh, in Libya and in other countries in the Arab world, what role the United States can play, and more importantly, as a journalist, uh, what our own obligations as a news organization are to covering these events. Are you comfortable, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned Libya, but are you comfortable with the dimensions of uh, Western, both American, and, and, and the NATO role in this? When you reported and on uh, Egypt and Tunisia, of course, these were homegrown movements. The, the, it, was, it was deeply built. There was a high quality opposition. I met folks at the Al Jazeera Forum that, that may or may not have been part of the key to success, but they saw themselves, you know, the, the Academy of Change, where they said they, you know, someone, uh, one of your colleagues referred to them sort of, it was like 
you know, building Noah's Ark before the flood. Uh, but there was a lot of planning uh, in, a, in a place like Egypt for the kinds of change, and it was a very sophisticated uh, network, which I think isn't the case in, in Libya quite to the same degree. But now you've got Western intervention. Of course, there were some calls for Western intervention. But the frames in Al Jazeera, just like I said, changed immediately. They changed to what will the West do or not do, as opposed to what is the quality of opposition and what are the people calling for. Are you yeah. comfortable with that? Well, I think I'm, I am concerned about that uh, as a journalist. My job is to be critical. And certainly in this perspective, what I can say is having covered the Arab street for so many years, uh, there is a concern on the minds of ordinary Arabs as to what the motivations behind uh, the West's military intervention is. And yes, we know that there are Arab countries involved, and we know that the League of Arab States uh, endorsed the no-fly zone. But let's not kid ourselves. At the end of the day, we know that this is very much a Western military operation. That's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that to be negative. I think this is one of the first unique opportunities in recent era where there is a convergence of interests between Western military intervention and what a vast majority of uh, Arabs on the Arab street want, which is the ousting of Muammar Gaddafi. Now, having said that, the question really depends on the scope of the military operation, whether or not we're going to see it broaden, deepen, uh, and more importantly, what type of conditions or caveats can be imposed in exchange for this military intervention? And that is perhaps the question that we don't necessarily uh, know the answer to. Was there anything offer, uh, offered or incentivized to the Western military powers to intervene on behalf of the National Transitional Council uh, in exchange for something down the road? We don't know. And I think these are the questions that are not necessarily uh, bad to answer, but given uh, America's recent military involvement in the Middle East, it is approached with a great deal of skepticism. Uh, I also think it's a great opportunity for the United States to kind of repair some of the damage that it has caused over the past several years or it has suffered from over the past several years in military intervention in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. It's un what is perceived to be uh, its bias in dealing with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. These issues have eroded America's credibility in the Middle East this Libyan intervention could be a way to restore some of that. Did President Obama's speech last night satisfy your concern? Uh, as an American citizen, definitely. <laughs> as, an, uh, as a journalist, I still think that there are some questions. But no doubt that there were a, a lot of uh, tones in uh, President Obama's speech um, that were very positive uh, and I think addressed some of the uh, growing questions that we've seen in the American media about uh, the United States military intervention. What is more important, though, I think speaking here, um, you know, a as somebody from the Arab street, is whether or not President Obama could apply the same principles to other realms of American foreign policy in the Middle East. Uh, the questions of justice, the questions of freedom, can they be applied to other countries? Can they be applied to countries going through revolutions or protests? Can they be applied to the Palestinians? Do their demands for freedom and their quest for independence, do they also meet the threshold of American support? And I think when you put it in that big frame, this is sometimes the challenge that the United States faces. It can make a great argument on a case-by-case -case basis for Libya, but can it make it systematically across the board for all Arabs? And I think it sometimes falls short of meeting that threshold, and therefore its credibility is tarnished. Tell us what it was like to be uh, in Tahrir Square in Egypt, your arrest. Give us a feel um, for, that, for that episode in your life, which, you know, I don't know if you want to talk about it, but it was pretty riveting when well, I heard about it before. Well, you know, Tahrir Square, I think one of the things that many people have come to know about it is that it, it, the universality of it, the diversity of the place had become uh, quite exhilarating. I mean, Tahrir Square almost became a city-state on its own. It was a fully functioning city-state in the sense that uh, it, it had a makeshift clinic, it had makeshift restaurants, it had makeshift entertainment, it had people camping out. Uh, and so when you looked at it, it represented everything that Egyptians had hoped their country would be. Egyptians knew their country could be. Uh, and for the first time in a long time, Egyptians were uh, optimistic about uh, them as a people because it had an entire cross-section of Egyptian society men, women, young and old, uh, Muslim and Christian, secular, religious, uh, and people will, there's a long list of things that people will tell you about Tahrir Square that they had never witnessed before, sometimes from the most trivial, that the fact that 
uh, Egyptians were standing in lines, which you know, anyone who spent time in Egypt knows that that in itself was a huge accomplishment, getting Egyptians to stand in line and not pushing up against each other, to the fact that it was a very celebratory and very festive atmosphere that showcased um, some of the most beautiful aspects of Egyptian culture, whether it was uh, the music and the, and the entertainment, to also the humor of Egyptians. All of that came to the surface and I think reinvigorated ordinary Egyptians in believing in themselves, believing in uh, you know, what they were trying to do. So that was for me quite exhilarating. My personal attention was, uh, it, it was nothing significant whatsoever. I mean, it paled in comparison to generally what was happening to the country and stuff. I was picked up by the military in my Wanda Tahrir uh, and essentially detained for nine hours. I think I was very fortunate because there was a huge public pressure campaign that was launched both diplomatically as well as on media uh, and on Twitter. Uh, that called for my release, and fortunately, it didn't last but nine hours. So, and had it had it been more, it would have been, you know, I suppose more exciting. <laughs> well, Any, anyway. very, I, I was very fortunate because, you know, my colleagues at Al Jazeera Arabic who were also detained by the military, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, they did not have the uh, campaign on Twitter for their release, and so they were held for much longer. I'd like to convince myself. How that would was the <laughs> how would uh, let me ask you a question, and and and, and I, I think it try to provoke you. How would you compare the quality? Uh, and the fabric of the opposition in Egypt to the opposition in Libya, to the opposition in Syria? Well, the opposition in Egypt was, A, very institutional in the sense that there were opposition parties in Egypt that had a long history of operating in the country. Uh, and those are the traditional ones, uh, which include the opposition parties, some of them even including the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, and the organizations that were not as politically uh, institutionalized like April 6 and some of these other movements. There were also uh, labor unions, there were also uh, private universities and others, all of them which contributed to the atmosphere of dissent, if you will. That atmosphere in itself is very different than in Libya, where in Libya, while there may have been opposition, uh, it was very suppressed, wasn't very visible, uh, no political parties, no unions that could help erode the, the regime from within, so to speak. The opposition that we're seeing in Egypt, uh, I'm sorry, in Libya right now, uh, mostly it's a very recent uh, development in the sense that there has always been the opposition, but only has it now become vocal and only has it now taken on the regime uh, head on. And many of the elements of the opposition were former members of the regime who have now defected, whether they are ambassadors here in the US or elsewhere, or even the former ministers of justice and interior, which represent the National Transitional Council. That in itself, uh, Syria is somewhere a hybrid between the two. It doesn't have the full-blown opposition that we've seen in Egypt or the institutions, but it's not completely a, a country where power was diffused like we saw in Libya. Um, and I think what is unique about all of these revolutions is that they're sometimes happening in the absence of traditional opposition. These are organic people's movements. The, these are movements that are coming to the surface uh, with the power of ordinary people, and in many cases, leaderless, and in many cases, um, without any single party leading them. You know, from Tahrir Square, we never once saw the Muslim Brotherhood flag being waved. We never saw once the slogans of the Muslim Brotherhood being chanted or that of any individual party, because genuinely, the only flag that was waving was the Egyptian flag. Uh, and so I genuinely believe these movements have been organic, uh, and the fact that they have been leaderless has been a great added value, added advantage to uh, the authenticity of these protests. And I think that's why the regimes are so afraid of them. What, what do you, how do you think Americans should, should think about and, and frame the Muslim Brotherhood? I mean, there's a big phobia about it. It's beginning to take on its own brand name. Um, a lot is thrown in in there. Uh, I recently at the J Street uh, conference moderated a panel where Mona uh, al Tahawi was uh, in the panel and she says, I have no problem the Muslim Brotherhood being at the table as long as I'm at the table too. Uh, uh, a leading uh, a woman advocate in, in the Egyptian uh, political blogging scene. And so I'd like to know from you how you, when you report on the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, do you think the United States needs to get an engagement strategy? Should we continue to put up walls? What, how, how, help us think about how we should deal with the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, one, when I report on the Muslim Brotherhood, I report on it that it is a key part of Egypt's political and social and cultural fabric. Uh, this is not an organization that is on the fringes. It is not an extremist organization. This is a mainstream organization. As a political party, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is 
uh, still has a long way to go to prove that it can play within the rules of a secular game. They're trying to allay some of those fears right now with some of the recent announcements they've made, which is that they're not going to field a presidential candidate. They're only going to compete for nearly 30% uh, of the seats in parliament. So by very definition, even if they win every seat, they will not have a majority of parliament and therefore be part of a broader system of governance. Uh, they recognize these concerns, and I think they're very uh, amenable and pragmatic organization. That's one. Two, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, is no different than uh, the AK party in Turkey, is no different than the Shas party in Israel, which is an ultra-Orthodox party. It's no different than the Christian Democrats in Germany, in the sense that they may be parties that draw their political ideology from a religious doctrine, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to apply religious uh, concepts in how to deal with every problem in life. Now, how see the headline, Muslim Brotherhood and Christian Democrats uh, <laughs> on the, the same part. But anyway, that, that'd be... Uh, but the way the United States should deal with it is not be so dogmatic. The United mm. States should have its own interests and should have its own interests at heart, but should not be as dogmatic in saying we simply will not talk to the Muslim Brotherhood. If you do that, you've alienated a huge part of the Egyptian society which is not necessarily ideologically in line with the Muslim Brotherhood, but supports them for years because they were perhaps the most legitimate form of opposition in the country. But the United States needs to, uh, in, in my opinion, I think it would advan advance the United States' interest to engage the Muslim Brotherhood uh, to, to find a way to interact more so than just to put up, as you said, barriers and keep them on one side and isolate them. Let's talk about women. Um, you know, when you think about it, there, there are a couple of things when you look at the changes going on, and, and as I watch uh, Al Jazeera and see uh, some of the young people involved and others, you see women part of the movement, what's going on, and uh, I guess we have a frame looking at large parts of this world and either don't understand or don't often see women playing leadership roles uh, in change. And so what do you think women are in these revolutions? I think they have been at the forefront of the revolutions. They have been there uh, shoulder to shoulder with their male counterparts, and they have played instrumental roles, in some countries more so than others. I mean, Tunisia, a very traditionally secular country, had some of the most uh, protective laws for women's rights and uh, considered to be among the most advanced countries in the Arab world in terms of the rights of uh, women in participation and stuff. I think, generally speaking, these countries remain very patriarchal. So it's still difficult for women to get a seat at the table, particularly in countries like Egypt and perhaps even going forward like Libya. There was a great deal of concern that women were not represented in the panel that was tasked with uh, developing new uh, amendments to the constitutional articles. That was one concern. Uh, and going forward, it's going to be interesting to see what role women play in the political parties that may emerge as a result of these revolutions. Uh, but no doubt on the street in these revolutions, uh, the voices of women were just as instrumental in calling on people to come out and participating uh, and getting women to be part of the support infrastructure behind so many of these revolutionary movements, particularly uh, in Tahrir Square. But I still believe the road is long. It's going to be bumpy. There are going to be a lot of challenges for women as for other groups within uh, the Egyptian political arena. Egypt is waking up to its uh, post-party hangover, uh, and it's going mm -hmm. to see that there are definitely a lot of difficult questions that Egyptians have to begin answering about themselves, whether it's minority rights in terms of uh, Coptic Christians, whether mm -hmm. it's about women, whether it's about other minorities in Egypt, whether it's Nubians and Bedouins and the distribution of wealth, but it's, it's going to be a long road. When I look at the Middle East, you know, I'm, I'm sort of trained to think about the geostrategic frames, and I see competition between the real superpowers in the region or Iran the Saudis, and Israel. And, and, and go through three, those three and tell me who's, whose interests are enhanced and whose interests are pushed back given the, the major changes in the region. Well, in, in my humble opinion, I don't think any of these individual countries' interests are advanced by what is happening in the revolution. In that sense, they're all in the same boat for the first time, perhaps, that they're all looking at these changes with very uh, cautious eyes. Uh, there are some that have argued despite the, the rhetoric that we hear, that peace and stability and democracy are perhaps the biggest challenges to Israel's national security uh, objectives. That Israel is a country that has existed based on uh, the notion that there's always a security threat and therefore it legitimizes the way it uses and projects its military in the way it deals with the Palestinians, in the way it has uh, given itself 
um, the right to sometimes carry out attacks in other countries, always under the umbrella of this is in our national interest. Well, what happens when you have democratic countries that are neighboring Israel that look out for their own national interest and reject the notion that Israel can carry out these types of attacks mm. uh, and for the first time defend their own national security interests with the same rigor that Israel defends its own. And I think this in itself is going to pose uh, a challenge that if you have an Egypt that actually reflects the will of its people, that reflects the will of the citizens of Egypt and what they prioritize to be their national security agendas, well, maybe then the siege on Gaza will no longer exist because there's a greater sense of empathy for the people of Gaza uh, and the government of Egypt is not beholden to the interests of Israel and to the U.S. So this is perhaps one potential challenge for a country like Israel. For Saudi Arabia and Iran, similar in principle in the sense that you now have these regimes that will be challenged uh, by people power. And what I mean by that is if there's one thing that is a commonality among all of these countries is that the fear factor has genuinely been broken. People now, whether it's in the village of Sidi Bouzid uh, or Cairo or Tehran, are starting to feel that they have been empowered uh, and that they shouldn't be afraid of their regimes and that the relationship between the state and the people is now being redefined. Uh, and that I think is going to be the challenge for uh, Iran and for countries like Saudi Arabia. They now have to engage their citizenry in a different way. They're either going to have to resort to violence, as we have seen in Libya or in other countries, or they're going to have to offer genuine, substantial reforms to appease the protesters, which are genuinely now demanding these reforms, and not simply piecemeal concessions. Amen. I was just reading last night, Al the Al Jazeera uh, Transparency Unit is publishing a book, uh, for those of you who don't know, you can access it online, called The Palestine Papers uh, by Clayton Swisher, um, editing this. Uh, it's a really interesting book, and when you look at now the political fallout of that, and you take your comments there, what chances do you think any of the countries that have, if you were to speculate and look at you know, successor governments that, that come in, would, would they be able to, because I, to deal with Israel and to deal with something like an Arab peace initiative, I've always felt there can't be a false choice for the United States between Israel's interests and Arab interests, that somehow they need to be um, uh, thrown together and there's got to be a track forward. And I thought that the Arab peace deal was as close as it could come. Now I wonder, given the fallout of the Palestine Papers and given the shifts that are likely to come in terms of a potential Muslim Brotherhood participation in any of these governments, do you think any of them can get over uh, a kind of legitimacy um, challenge from political opponents to actually do constructive deal making with Israel down the road. Do you think you think deal making with Israel is just just off the table now for a while? No, not at all. I think that quite the opposite. I think that um, you know if if we had to make a comparison and and look at something to make it a little bit more analogous, you can have a country like Turkey, which is dominated by an ACT party, which is uh, you know considered mm -hmm. to be. Uh, Islamic leaning and conservative leaning um, that has a relationship with Israel, continues the strategic partnership it has, but is very vocal and very critical of the Israeli policies and works to advance its own national interest. So being a democracy uh, and being independent and sovereign in your foreign policy does not necessarily mean that you are going to abandon uh, principles of stability in the region. It doesn't mean that Egypt is going to break away from the peace treaty uh, with Israel, the Camp David peace treaty. But what it means is that uh, for the first time, if you have a government in Egypt that represents the will of its people, its interests will not be dictated by the West, will not be dictated in the priority that the countries such as Israel and the United States want. And mm -hmm. I think this has always been the biggest criticism of the Arab world. Not that they necessarily reject peace with Israel, but they believe that the states are not working in the interests of the people, that their foreign policy is not sovereign uh, and does not reflect the will of the people or the priorities of the people. If that changes, if that recalibrates, it does not necessarily mean you will not have peace with Israel. It just means that the terms of the peace may be different. And for the first time, it will actually perhaps have a positive influence on uh, how Israel views itself in the region, how Israel deals with the Palestinian issue, and as you mentioned, how the United States compares its interests in the Arab world and its interests towards Israel. Those two are not necessarily mutually exclusive. They can be uh, inclusive. You can advance your interests in the Arab world as democratic Arab states, and you can advance your interests with Israel. That's great. Let me, uh, I'm gonna open the floor. I just have two, two other quick questions, so whoever the uh, 
uh, mic carriers are, I want to open up to everyone. Uh, but let me ask you a quickly, uh, you, you probably met uh, Wild Gonim when you were there. Uh, I'm sure you connected with him or saw him when he was there. How many Wild Gonims are out there uh, in, in terms of the role? And, and for those of you who don't know, this was a young Google executive uh, essentially on family leave um, from Dubai, had lived in Dubai, went into uh, Egypt, I guess was a, a arrested for a period of time, came out and essentially became uh, maybe an unwitting political force, but essentially had a large part to do with laying out the, the social networks that led to some of the incredibly uh, inspiring and impressive gatherings of crowds. And at Doha, again, at the Al Jazeera Forum, there were these young 21, 22, I don't know, maybe they were 17, who knows, they were just yeah. young people. Yeah. Do, do you think that he has changed the way young people in social networks look at their political role? Well, first of all, I, I haven't had the privilege of meeting Wael Ghanim, surprisingly, uh, <laughs> surprisingly enough. Um, I'm sorry to mention that if that's a sore spot. No, no, oh. not at all, not at all. <laughs> no, I wish. I think it's just uh, he, he's been quite a, a busy guy, and uh, yeah. I, I think our paths haven't, uh, haven't uh, crossed. Uh, and and the, I, I've never met him, but he, he's clearly as someone having watched him many times. Is someone I have great respect and admiration for. Um, I think two things. One, um, Wael Ghanim doesn't necessarily represent the type of social media activism that became a main staple of uh, the Egyptian revolution. And why I say that is because uh, his social media forum, which was the We Are All Khaled Said website, uh, represents the more um, participatory forums, for example, like where you see people jumping in and subscribing and, and you know contributing and it becomes like that. The other type of activism which I think actually preceded the revolution are the blogger types and the people who would actually post a lot of the information uh, and the, the videos that were being leaked of torture and abuse. So they, they operated on slightly two different levels. One preceded the revolution and one came post-revolution. But why Wa'al Ghanim was so important is because he actually I personally believe he gave a very impassioned interview after he was released in Egypt uh, on one of the most prominent Egyptian talk shows in the evening uh, where he essentially broke down and, uh, and cried. Uh, and I think for the first time, ordinary Egyptians had seen the power of just one ordinary civilian. There was nothing special about Wa'al Ghanim. There was nothing particularly unique about him. He was not the son of uh, privileged Egyptians or powerful Egyptians. He was not uh, the son of a minister. He, he, he was not a prominent person. He just spoke from the heart and impassionately, very, very passionately. And I think that galvanized Egyptians at a time when the revolution had begun to lose some of its own moral support and public support in Egypt. This was at a time when the Egyptian government had unleashed a very aggressive media campaign against the protesters, calling them uh, American agents, saying that they were undermining the security of Egypt, that uh, they were disrupting the economic flow and destroying the livelihood. So it began to erode some of the Egyptians' perception of what Tahrir was about. Uh, and so when Wa'al Ghanim came out and spoke, he helped, I think, refocus a lot of ordinary Egyptians, what this protest was about. He was a person who had been caught up, illegally detained, held in prison for such a long time by the notorious security services uh, without anyone knowing what happened to him. And when he came out and gave this impassioned speech, I, helped, I think he refocused it. That's why I think his case is very different than the, the thousands of Egyptian bloggers who day in and day out chipped away at the regime by posting these pictures, by getting these testimonials of accounts uh, of torture and abuse by obtaining these documents that suggested wrongdoing by the regime. Those people chipped away at the regime systematically for years. And those are the individuals that we as journalists had become in touch with, spoke with, became re in regular contact with for information. Uh, the Wa'al Ghanim type came post-revolution and they were a bit of a, a more of a moral boost. So that, that's the distinction I make. There are uh, not necessarily thousands of Wa'al Ghanim uh, in terms of the kind of moral boost he gave, but I think there are thousands upon thousands of ordinary Egyptians empowered by information that have helped contribute to the collapse of this regime, whether it was through cell phones, Facebook and Twitter, satellite channels, and just ordinary Egyptians playing their part. It's important to keep in mind these revolutions did not start on January the 25th or 28th. I mean, Egyptians would take great offense to that. These are revolutions that ignited on those days, without a doubt, but these are revolutions that had been in the making for years. Right. I mean, if you talk to April 6th uh, youth, they had been systematically working on planning protests weekly, day in and day out, labor unions in Egypt, organizing wages. There were the Mahalla riots, I believe, in uh, 2006 or 2008. 
The, these protests chipped away at the regime and created the conditions by which the catalyst came in and ignited the revolution. Well, it certainly was amazing to watch you uh, reporting this. I mean, I think we were all addicted uh, to Al Jazeera to find it, trying to find channel 275 uh, uh, there. Um, I guess finally, you know, one of the things that happened, and I think one of the really interesting stories that I don't think has been told as well and dispassionately as should have been, ha had, had been the, the resurgence of Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. That you saw uh, the opposition rise, it was inspiring, and you saw Gaddafi's cards sort of falling quickly. Uh, amazing defections from his command staff, diplomatic staff, and the guy came roaring back um, in unbelievable time. And it, and it showed uh, how he understands at least his own power. When, if I had been a leader and I saw so many defections from my uh, core people, yeah. well, not only demoralized, you wouldn't know who to trust and who not to. And so when you're a leader and you're trying to then mechanize and animate a return, it's, it is, despite any moral position, incredibly uh, impressive what Gaddafi did to roll back over the opposition. And it raises the natural question is, if not Libya, because I hear there are rumors now of trying to put together an exit package for him. We'll see if that, those are true or not. Um, there can be lots of different kinds of exit packages, I'm sure. <laughs> but but the, the other part of it is, what happens, do you think, the first time uh, the people lose, really lose, in, in one of these near-term revolutions? Do you think it has a, an effect that just shuts well, down, or do you think that these movements will continue to move in country by country uh, uh, dynamics driven by different factors? L let me just ask you, what defines losing? Well, I would have defined losing Gaddafi moving into Benghazi, shutting things down, and maintaining clear control after such a substantial opposition in which I know this White House actually thought and were planning scenarios to begin thinking that he wouldn't necessarily be pushed out, but he would be in a stronghold in a small part of Libya, and what to do then with the opposition that largely controlled the rest of the, of the government. Of course, that collapsed, but that yeah. was a scenario we were looking at. So his ability to take that back, I think, would constitute losing. Yeah, I, I genuinely don't think the people can lose. Um, I think they can pay a very heavy price, but I think in the long run, um, by very nature of what is happening, the people cannot lose. Um, so I, I, I genuinely feel that what we saw in Libya uh, in terms of the resurgence of Gaddafi, I mean, before even we got to this stage, I, I think by some estimates there have been 5,000 to 6,000 people that have been killed uh, in this conflict. That's, you know, by some estimates. Uh, and that is, I mean, people can say that is a loss. There's no doubt about it. Um, but the question is, are the people determined to impose this change? And whether or not Qaddafi stays in power, the rules of the game have changed. Uh, Qaddafi in power will not be the Qaddafi he was prior to uh, February 17th. That's a fact. And I think that's why there is this kind of outlash uh, in terms of the violence that he is using. Keep in mind that in a country like, um, uh, well, I mean, in the Balkans, even with Slobodan Milosevic, after the... Uh, military intervention, he remained in power. Even in 1991, after Saddam Hussein was ousted from Kuwait, he remained in power. Their powers were extremely curtailed, and ultimately they were, um, you know, their wings were clipped and they were removed from power. But I think time uh, is on the side of the people, and by that definition, they will not lose. But what has happened in Libya, what has changed the rules of the game, is that unlike Tunisia and Egypt, Arab leaders now, some Arab leaders may look at Qaddafi and say, I'm not going to give up power that easily. I'm going to make it very costly for them to remove me from my seat of power, whether that's in Yemen, whether that's in Syria. But there's no doubt, to say the least, the genie is out of the bottle uh, in the sense that every one of these Arab leaders is calculating, and actually every almost minister of defense or almost every Arab chief of staff is going to be sitting there and asking himself, what am I going to do when I am asked to open on my protesters and asked to kind of quell these uprisings. And here, the Tunisian and Egyptian models, uh, the, the leaders looked at them and said, they gave up power too easily, um, and they're going to pay a very heavy price. So why should I do that? And then Gaddafi has interjected a third model. The problem is, I don't think any two countries in the Arab world are the same. So the forces at play are very different. What happened in Tunisia was very different than what happened in Egypt. Um, the role of the militaries were different. The outcomes were different. Uh, nonetheless, the rise of people was the same, and I think mm -hmm. we will see that happen 
But every country is going to go through its own course. Every country may not be violent. Some may be uh, reform-driven. Some may be people-driven. Others may be concessions. Others may be violence. But I think the winds of change will spread across the entire Arab world. There will not be a country that will be immune from this. Interesting. Well, thank you. Let me open up the floor uh, to those who'd like to ask uh, questions. Right here in the middle, the lady in the middle here. Yeah, hi. Uh, Andrea Barron, George Mason University. Uh, how important do you think that human rights violations like the pervasive sexual harassment of women will be in post-revolutionary Egypt? And uh, I'm more concerned about these kinds of human rights violations because they affect so many women, old and young, uh, Muslim and Christian, veiled and bareheaded. And also, if the Muslim Brotherhood becomes much more involved in the political process, isn't there a good possibility that equality for women will be sacrificed? Should we just take yes. one at a time? Yeah, okay. Okay. by now, until, until I get tired of taking them one at a time. <laughs> okay, great. I'll try to keep my answers brief to get as many questions as possible. Um, like I was saying earlier, I, I genuinely think the road is going to be very long for women. I think there are still going to be human rights violations. The transition from military uh, dictatorship, if you will, to a genuine democracy uh, is not going to happen overnight because you're not only changing systems of governance and building institutions to hold people accountable for the violations they commit, but you need to change the culture of ordinary Egyptians. Uh, and you need to get ordinary Egyptians to recognize what their responsibilities are towards women's rights and towards minority rights and others. So I genuinely think we're still going to see human rights violations. But what we also want to see is the institutions to hold people account for when they commit these violations, whether it's the police force, whether it's ordinary people on the street, that you can't just commit these types of violations. You cannot commit these types of violations under the name of cultural practices that are sometimes happen in more rural areas, uh, and then simply just get away with it. That needs to change. That's going to take time, and it's going to take education. I do not believe that the participation of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, is going to curb women's political participation. The Muslim Brotherhood itself fields women candidates in the political process in Egypt. Again, I genuinely believe that if, if the rules of the game are very well enshrined uh, and the institutions of the state become bigger than individual players and everyone plays by the rules, there is no reason why the Muslim Brotherhood cannot participate in its own uh, ideological uh, agenda in, in these elections. But I, I, I think it's bad to ignore them. It's bad to be afraid of them. It's much better to engage them. And I think uh, I agree with what Muna was saying, that the Muslim Brotherhood should have a seat at the table. And right across from them should be the, the voices of women, the voices of minorities, the voices of every cross-section of Egyptian society. Great, thank you. And someone on this side, let's, let's uh, bring up here and we'll work back. Right here, yes, sir? Right in the front. Thank you. Uh, Gary Forber from the Epoch Times. Um, I, uh, my perception of, of uh, these revolutions is the uh, immense role that the youth are playing. And I noticed that when they interviewed some uh, Muslim Brotherhood, even there, there seems to be a big split uh, between the, the, uh, the older Muslim Brotherhood and the youth yeah. in the Muslim Brotherhood. So is this the, uh, the most powerful uh, cleavage? Uh, is this basically a youth-driven revolution? Great, thank you. Yes, absolutely. If I could say it in short, yes, it is youth-driven. And the re it's, it's youth-driven for a simple reason. It's, it's not youth-exclusive, but it is youth-driven. Uh, it's a youth that had grown isolated, not convinced by the rhetoric of these regimes. 60% of the Arab world is under the age of 30. Uh, and I think that is a huge uh, demographic component in the force that shaped that. And you're absolutely right. Even within the Muslim Brotherhood, just last year when they were getting ready to elect their new uh, general guide, as he's called, or the, or the guide general, like the equivalent of the secretary general of the, of the Muslim Brotherhood. He, there was a huge division with the Muslim Brotherhood as to who it should be, whether it should be someone like Muhammad al badiya a much seasoned, older veteran member of the Muslim Brotherhood, or a younger, more charismatic, more energetic type of leader. So that debate even exists within the Muslim Brotherhood. But definitely that youth were a driving force behind these revolutions. Right here, second row. Hi, Maher Kayyum. Thanks for your comments. I was just wondering if I could pick up on something. You mentioned that YouTube and Facebook are like catalysts for these particular revolutions, but it just seems that also, even if it takes years in the making, uh, the media has that strong role of being a watchdog. So for in the case of Syria, I'm wondering what is that catalyst or aside from blogging and citizen journalists, what is that one 
extra piece or catalyst that's needed for Al Jazeera to dig deeper into that particular revolution because we're not seeing as many reports with that. Well, I, 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 I'm not one who subscribes to the notion that these are Facebook or Twitter revolutions, but as I was saying, these are information revolutions. These are revolutions empowered by information. So uh, the catalyst was in each one of these countries something different. In Tunisia, it was a young fruit and vegetable seller who set himself on fire. Uh, and you know, going back to the youth question, I think he was 22 or 23 years old, a man who had his entire life ahead of him. The fact that he set himself on fire ignited this protest in which the, the, the protest itself became the catalyst for the Egyptian revolution. It became the catalyst for the Tunisian revolution. People looked at it in Egypt and said, well, why not in Egypt what they did in Tunisia? So that catalyst is the information, not necessarily Facebook and Twitter. In Syria, I think that, first of all, Al Jazeera has had multiple teams on the ground in Syria. We, we had exclusive reports from Dara, uh, our colleague Zena Khud. I'm talking here about Al Jazeera English. Um, there's always within every editorial process the judgment as to when a specific story becomes big enough uh, that it merits uh, a certain degree of coverage. You know, when we were covering Libya, uh, then the Jap Japan earthquake happened. We had to divert a lot of resources to Japan, but then we came back to Libya. So every, every editorial cycle goes through a decision-making process. Uh, and Syria, once it reaches a certain threshold, will get put right up there in the top few stories. I think Al Jazeera Arabic right now um, and Al Jazeera English certainly preoccupied the events in Libya because it's now become a much more international conflict with the military intervention. But nonetheless, everything goes through. I can't speak as to what the catalyst will be for the revolution of Syria. I mean, that's not in my position to say. Uh, but what I can say is that once it reaches a certain threshold, uh, rest assured that Al Jazeera will be there to cover it in whatever capacity it can. Now how much, I mean, just to jump on that, how much do you think the protesters playbook now includes you as an automatic piece of this? That r aside from Facebook and Twitter, do, do they think they could be doing what they want? Every time you have a protest against the government, you essentially have bets on power. They somehow bet they think there's enough weakness or enough chance. These aren't fundamentally irrational movements. There's a rational strategy. Do you think that Al Jazeera has become so vital to the game plan of protests that they wouldn't happen if you weren't there? And, and, and what dynamic does that now represent for governments that are worried about you? Well, well the evidence is that they happened in the absence of Al Jazeera. They mm. happened in Sidi Bouzid, and they happened in Tunisia when Al Jazeera mm. wasn't there. And these are places that Al Jazeera has been. So we know that they will happen in the absence of Al Jazeera. Mm. They happened in the absence of Al Jazeera in Libya. They happened in the absence of Al Jazeera uh, in other countries, like in Dara and Syria. So mm. we know that they will happen without. Now, there's no doubt that uh, Al Jazeera is not, as some have described it, the, the voice of the revolution or the voice of the protesters. It has simply amplified, simply allowed for these voices to be taken beyond borders, beyond limitations of uh, their restrictions. I mean, when you talk about internet usage in the Arab world, Facebook and, and, and Twitter, a, a, a large number of people have access to them. But that's not, th that's not the driving force behind people's participation in these revolutions. It's the fact that people can turn on their television, uh, whether they can read or not, whether they're in the countryside or not, whether they're sophisticated or not, or you know, wealthy or not, and they're empowered by the images that they see. And when they see these images, they say, well, why not me? Why not us? And that's what I think galvanizes and mobilizes them. Uh, I think the protesters have now felt that they have an outlet that allows them to speak, where it used to be state media uh, that would control the, the regime's message and prevent people from speaking. Now they believe there is a media outlet, uh, not just satellite channels, but also the internet and social media, that allows people to speak. At the end of the day, social media are forms of social justice. The, these are, play, like you said, Wa'al Ghanim can be an individual who creates a page that has 5,000 supporters all supporting and writing into that Facebook forum. Mm -hmm. it has an, it's become an outlet for people to voices to be heard. And in that context, Al Jazeera is no different. It is a forum whereby people's voices can be heard. Great. Uh, right here, this gentleman. And I'll begin clustering. There's so many. So yes, go ahead. Kyle Renner, George Washington University. Uh, two questions. What do you think has actually changed in Egypt? We've gone from a military general to a military general to a military general to a military council. Um, and then uh, secondly, um, do you believe uh, and what are your thoughts on, on a different response by the U.S. government uh, to revolutions potentially occurring in the Gulf versus uh, occurring in North Africa or the Levant? Uh, it seems as if there might be something there. Great. Uh, thank you. And let's go right to this gentleman here and then to this gentleman over here. My question is, does the process that, that Al Jazeera had work both ways? 
What, what happens when the audiences in, in Egypt and Libya and other places uh, uh, see pictures about what uh, Peter King was doing here in the United States with uh, trying to demonize Muslims, saying that they're all potential terrorists, et cetera? You know, how do people respond to that, and does that create problems for the credibility of the United States? Okay, thank you. And this gentleman here. Yeah. <coughs> Doug Foxfog, independent consultant. Uh, two short questions. One, could you compare the B Bahrain protest movement with that in Tunisia and uh, Egypt? And s second, what actual support for Gaddafi is there in Libya? Okay, great. Okay. You got all that? Yep. Okay. What has really changed in Egypt? What has changed in Egypt fundamentally is the relationship between the state and the citizens, whereby the state used to be the sole proprietor and the exclusive holder of the rights of the citizens uh, and all of the natural resources of the country um, and used to have a monopoly on this. Today, the citizens are saying, no, we want to be a partnership. They're saying it. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen. Uh, we're going to find out whether or not the military is going to listen in the next six months and post uh, elections. But fundamentally what has changed is that where the government theoretically used to ignore them, now it so far has at least listened to them and whether or not they incorporate it. And more importantly, it's important to notice that it's given birth to a new generation of Egyptian leaders, uh, including Assam Sharaf, who's the current prime minister, a Western educated from Purdue University, uh, and who's now the prime minister. He himself was a name recommended by the revolutionary groups. That in itself is unprecedented for the first time one of the top political positions in the country was a name chosen by the people of Egypt that we want him to represent us. Again, this is just important symbolically, and with time we will test whether or not it becomes practically important. So that's the first and most important change. Um, the different diff response to different revolutions in regionally. Yes, definitely. I, um, there are, there's no doubt that the United States is kind of going country by country evaluating uh, a cost benefit analysis. What do we gain in terms of having a pro-democratic government or a revolution? What do we lose? Uh, and each one is going to be different. I think in the Gulf it probably speaks for itself. Great amount of natural resources the United States simply can't afford to see that part of the world become very destabilized very quickly. If the Tunisian and Egyptian models are anything, they have shown that they can be revolutions and still be involved in uh, strategic partnerships with the United States. So that may alter the way the U.S. perceives change in the Gulf. But right now what we're witnessing is that um, the United States foreign policy is safe to say is interest driven. Uh, people in the Arab world want to see it value driven. They want to see it represent more of the values and ideals that the United States practices at home, not just in its interest. So I think it'll be interesting to see whether the United States adjusts to that uh, in the near future. Some are skeptical. <laughs> some are, some are as, a, as a progressive <laughs> realist myself. Yeah, some are skeptical, uh, yeah. others are optimistic. It'll be interesting right, to see. Right, right, uh, Al Jazeera, how does it deal with things like the King uh, hearings? Uh, it covers them and it puts it in proper context in relationship to where they fit in the wider American political uh, spectrum. Uh, it's, you know, there was also the incident with the Quran burning in uh, Florida that happened, I think, a couple years ago or a couple months ago. Um, these things do not do a service to America, they don't represent America. But at the same time, they, uh, they're a reality of America. And I think that most people in the Arab world, they watch what is happening in America unfold with great concern that there is an increase in uh, the rhetoric against Muslims uh, and the tolerance against Muslims. And I think that creates a sense that uh, perhaps America needs to take some tough questions at itself uh, and perhaps not just necessarily espouse these values abroad, but practice some of them in terms of its tolerance and acceptance of diverse viewpoints. They certainly hurt America's image, but I can uh, tell you firsthand that um, uh, American foreign policy is the biggest detriment to America's image, more so than Peter King or any of these uh, individuals that, that do these one-off acts. You know, I attended the uh, TED forums in Long Beach this year, and um, Wada Kanfar, the Director General of Al Jazeera, spoke there, and Al Jazeera had a lunch. And at the lunch, although Kanfar had gone by that time, a gentleman in the audience had asked, was Al Jazeera fair? Did it, did it, and, and, and how did it deal with the question of Sharia law and Islamists? And, and did it make the point that there's no, this, from this person's point of view, that there's no uh, legitimate bridge between real democracy and anyone that was going to live in Sharia law? And it was very interesting because um, Satnam uh, Mataru, who uh, responded, said, 
you know, I was, I was over and he says, if you watch our shows, you'll see everyone, which is true. I've, I've been on Al Jazeera with the head of the Zionist Organization of America or Danny Aiello and the Deputy Foreign Minister of, uh, of Israel and others. And there's, you know, and, and some really crazy theologian from, uh, from Islam, some Islamic sect, which is, you know, sometimes uncomfortable for me. I mean, it's all uncomfortable for me. But, <laughs> but the, the diversity is amazing. And he made the comment, he says, I watched five minutes of Fox um, around this time. And there was absolutely zero diversity. He says, if I ran uh, our network, meaning Al Jazeera, for just a short time like Fox ran its network and how narrow the perspective was, we'd be out of business. So it, I just wanted to throw that in. I think yeah. it's an interesting way to look at these things. Um, Bahrain, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, differences, yeah. Okay. Um, I generally don't think that Gaddafi has a lot of support. I think that he, right now, uh, his support is definitely inflated by the perception that, his, that he's able to command forces to retake parts of the country. But I don't think that ordinary Libyans who have become so aware of what is at stake uh, generally support him and what he represents. I think what's at stake, unfortunately, though, is with this military intervention is the fear that now we may have another attempt by Western powers to interfere in our domestic affairs, which may then kind of swing a little bit of the pendulum back uh, in favor of Gaddafi. Not for him as a person or his regime, but almost a backlash against uh, Western military intervention in a country like Libya. Um, is, sorry, and what, there was a question about is there a difference between Bahrain, Bahrain and, Tunisia, and Tunisia, Egypt? Yeah, yeah th there's no doubt that the forces at play in Bahrain and Tunisia are very different. Um, the problems, the symptoms of the problems are similar across the Arab world. There's corruption, there's poverty, there's a lack of accountability, lack of rule of law, lack of uh, human rights. But what brings them to the surface in each one of these countries is different. Part of it is youth. In uh, Bahrain, despite some of the reporting I've seen, this is not a sectarian conflict. These are not Shias demanding they want to uh, be the ones running the country in majority or to run the country because they are the majority. Uh, and it's not against Sunni Muslims. What the problem in, in Bahrain is that the Shia majority have been suppressed. They're being deprived their fundamental human rights, their basic human rights. They can't get jobs without having Sunni sponsors. They can't uh, have a seat uh, at the political table. Uh, and they're economically suppressed. Some of their areas are the most uh, economically impoverished. So I think what they want to see is their rights respected in this system of governance that is a monarchy. That is very different than what were the forces that gave birth to the Tunisian Revolution, uh, and certainly that what gave birth to the Egyptian one, where people were being not necessarily just deprived of their political rights, but that the ruling elite had begun to completely usurp power uh, without any kind of accountability and abuse that power uh, in a way that was really unimaginable and no, and no longer sustainable. Okay, thanks. Let me just take a couple more questions. Right here, Stan. Yes, one, uh, one thing you, you haven't mentioned is, uh, is the word tribe. And uh, is there a tribal basis for conflict in these countries? I actually thought I heard you say tribe, but that's okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, well, what I was going to say is that um, Libya is not a tribal war. These are not tribes going to wars against each other, despite, with all due respect to what Thomas Friedman writes. These are not, <laughs> these are not, <laughs> these are, these are not tribal wars. Uh, and I have been to Libya. The, the, the forces at play are not tribal wars. Um, there are tribal fault lines that exist in Libya. But one of the reasons, and if you, if you spend some time in Libya, you understand why this is now emerging as a phenomenon, is that Libya generally was a country, as I was saying earlier, did not have key institutions, did not have political parties, did not have uh, private academic universities, did not have labor unions. So in the collapse of the uh, Qaddafi regime, uh, it was very difficult for people to coalesce around certain organizations where they felt loyal and they felt that they can trust people. Uh, in Egypt, people got around together around the April 6 movement. We were all part of the youth movement of April 6. We all trust each other. We are all the Muslim Brotherhood. We trust each other. So it was easy for these institutions to play a role in keeping people's loyalties and coalescing around them. In Libya, in the absence of these central institutions, what has given rise uh, to this coalescing of support are tribes. People are finding comfort and allegiances in these tribes where they say, you know what, if this tribe is with us against Gaddafi, then you and I are against uh, these people and or against this regime. That's very different than a tribal war. It's not a tribal war in the sense that we are going to take power so that we become the rulers and we become the masters. 
Uh, and that's why I think it's not tribal war. But tribes have become forces in this conflict because they are sources that which people can coalesce around. Uh, Kami? And then we'll uh, go yes, back here. Uh, my name is Kami, but I write for the Pakistani Spectator. Is there any kind of uh, backlash in the Middle East that, uh, for in, in, in the States, a lot of people are fearful that somehow in, in the disguise of these uh, uh, movement or uh, uh, upheaval, their Islamic Brotherhood would be the real winner. Uh, it, do you see that happening, or is it just kind of uh, uh, unfounded you. fear? And the second thing I, I observed, in, even in the United States, like secular Muslim, they don't have much cloud, like Dr. Akbar Ahmed from American University. And I read the testimony of Dr. Tommy, I gotta Seed, keep it short. who was behind the hearing of uh, uh, Muslim radicalization. He had a lot of reasonable things, but most Muslims don't pay attention to them. They just pay attention to care and isna. So uh, I was just wondering that if you have any uh, statement about secular Muslims, the Muslims who are not very, very, ra not radical, but not very committed. Sure, Thanks. So Islamic Brotherhood and, and, so, and we'll take just, uh, we'll just take a couple real here and we've got to close it down. So this gentleman here, this gentleman here, and then the one in the back. I apologize, we've got to close it down. So. Hi, Adnan Mirza. Yeah. Uh, my question, Eamon, is that um, probably a week and a half ago, the referendum passed on March 19th with about a 75% majority. Mm -hmm. Um, and this was a referendum that was opposed by most of the youth movements. Um, and you're already hearing that, I've heard things that uh, anecdotally that maybe the youth movement is moving to disarray, uh, maybe sort of cannibalizing itself in some ways. So what impact do you think the passing of the, Mar of the March 19th referendum had okay, on the you. mood of the youth thank movements? Thank you, right here. Wasn't there a question on this side? Yeah. All right, if there's not, okay, yes. Uh, thank you, Benjamin Tua. You referred to uh, powerful forces that are trying to halt what is happening in the uh, Arab world. Could you be more explicit about these forces and the extent to which they are internal and okay. external to the region? Great, and let's make sure that thing's on. And then, okay, just very quickly, these two, I'm sorry, don't put, I can't take any more hands. No, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, right here, these two, yes. Uh, Jeremy Presto, American Military University. I was just wondering if you could call upon your uh, experience with uh, Palestine and the Israeli conflict and uh, talk about uh, why you think the, uh, the revolution uh, in Tiber Square hasn't spread to the uh, Palestinian territories. Uh, okay. We've seen, uh, yep, okay. Great, and then this gentleman in the back. I'm sorry, we're just out of time. Hi, Chris Kiriakou from the Amar Foundation. I've been slightly preempted, but linking to the pace of the democratization process in Egypt um, and your feelings on that, that the referendum has take, taken place quite hastily and elections are due quite soon. I know several civil society organizations on the ground are quite worried that this will benefit the entrenched interests there. And even more so than the Muslim Brotherhood, who, as you say, are quite pragmatic and amenable, they're actually quite worried of the Salafist movements um, that are coming to the fore. They're both very well organized and very well funded from foreign funds. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we'll, yes. we'll, start, we'll start with that one. Um, yeah, I think there's a great cause of concern about the pace of change right now that's taking place in the Middle East. Um, I think, the, or particularly in, in Egypt, I think um, the military is an institution which wants to leave the country alone and want to be left alone. They want to go back to their uh, barriers, uh, or their barricades rather, and uh, essentially uh, continue running their businesses. It's, I mean, Egypt is a military, the military in Egypt is a big business. They operate industry, they build roads, they have factories, they build resorts. That, that's what I think they want to go back to. They don't want to be put in this position. So that's driving them to kind of quickly uh, go through these processes. Whether or not they're genuine, I think time will tell. And more importantly, whether or not uh, they are actually uh, bringing about the desired reform is still premature. We have to see what the civilian leadership that emerges out of all these changes does in terms of its taking over. Uh, the, the Salafists, the same principle applies in the sense that Egyptians don't necessarily fear ideologies. What they fear uh, is using these ideologies to exploit power. Uh, and so whether or not there's going to be a clear uh, benchmark or rules for the game by which these organizations can play part of a secular state, they're going to say, no problem, let the Salafists sit on the table. But it has to be that you play by the rules of the game. And whether or not Egypt makes that transition, I think, still uh, is still up in the air. Uh, in terms of the question about uh, the forces um, countering these revolutions, uh, these are forces that are some of them internal, meaning that there are a lot of powerful players within the regimes that don't want to see change. They have benefited from years of it. The economic elite, uh, the industrial elite that have had these, you know, 
billions of dollars of wealth coming flowing through them, particularly in countries like Egypt and perhaps even uh, Syria. Uh, a lot of the people with the military leadership and the security leadership of these countries don't want to see reform because it means that now you're going to have to challenge their power base. The Egyptian military is in a very difficult position. It's running the country and has to relinquish power, but not only relinquish power in the short term, it has to almost begin to accept that in the long run, it is going to concede institutional power that it has held onto for nearly 60 years in Egypt. So those are just some of the examples of the revolutionary, uh, counter-revolutionary forces. And there's always that cultural revolutionary force, which is people may not necessarily be comfortable with seeing um, the Muslim Brotherhood sitting at a table or seeing women sitting at a political table or vice versa. And so they launch these kind of counter-revolutions uh, that will speak about uh, these taking us against the values of what we want as a country and a society. Uh, in terms of the uh, Israel-Palestine conflict, why the revolutions have not spread, um, I think that, again, the winds of change will cover that part of the world. It takes time. Different forces that are at play. We've already, we've already have seen calls by Palestinians to organize rallies to encourage the Palestinian factions to unite, and in some cases call on Palestinians to organize rallies for a third uh, intifada or a third uprising. So again, these things take time. The forces against the Palestinians are much stronger, much harder than in some cases. They have to deal with occupation. They have to deal with geographic separation, checkpoints, and you know, you know the, the, the story. So I think it will get there, but certainly with time. Um, the March referendum, 75% voted uh, in favor. You're right, but there was also uh, a big part of that was in large part of the Muslim Brotherhood, which was among those part of the pro-revolutionary groups. I don't think that political pluralism is something that means uh, the cannibalization of the revolution. It just means that not everyone in the revolutionary groups agrees on the best way forward and the best timeline forward. That's not something that people should be afraid of. Uh, to put it in perspective, and, and there's certainly probably here Latin America experts more than I am, but the Chilean model took 15 years for it to transition from a military dictatorship into a slightly more civilian one. So six months is not necessarily uh, a long time. It's, it's actually rather a very short time. It's going to take time, uh, but these groups are not, are not all on the same page when it comes to their own political objectives and goals. We now know that it's different from the Muslim Brotherhood and some of these other movements. Uh, and I think there was one more question that I'm leaving out, the fear of uh, the Islamic Brotherhood that you were asking me about. As I was saying to, the, to that question, there's no fear that the Muslim Brotherhood or other Islamic extremist groups are going to come in and impose their ideology on people because these revolutions were not driven by the Muslim Brotherhood. They were not driven by the Salafists. The concern is uh, that they try to exploit power. And I don't think, and this is why I'm saying that one of the fundamental issues that has changed here is that there are no institutions now in Egypt that can say we are more powerful than the people. So the Muslim Brotherhood cannot stand up and say we feel that we have more power than those that gathered in Tahrir Square. I promise you from what I have been reading and what I feel in terms of the street that qu as quickly as the Muslim Brotherhood or any other party tries to exploit power, Tahrir Square would be filled up with just amount as uh, large amounts of numbers as people. Um, and hopefully, in terms of what you were saying about the secular voices, um, I think that really has to do with their own organization and their ability to have people represent them. I know from Al Jazeera's perspective, we try to have as many voices on as possible. As Steve was saying, we have no problem having on a Salafist as well as having on a secular women uh, you know, debating and talking. And that's the way it should be. So it's just a matter of them getting their voices uh, out through their own organizational abilities. Is there anyone, did I forget a question? Did somebody ask a question? I think that's a pretty good review. This, is, this has been a real treat. Um, and, and as I have, uh, uh, and as we've all been watching what's been, been happening in the, in the Middle East, and, it, and it's been, you know, the currents, the, the tsunami, the storm has been so big, so fast, so quickly moving. Our expectations have also been uh, kind of put in a turbocharged <laughs> expectation. I, rem you know, I, I remember Bosnia, and I remember uh, Rwanda, and how long it took to generate both an in, in international consensus on what to do and to get on the president's uh, calendar. And so the whole profile of the Obama administration's uh, direction in this case uh, has been radically different. But if you look at the press, they, they continue to critique Barack Obama for moving very slowly when by any comparative standard, it's been at warp speed. 
so it's, it is sometimes important to go back and look at what occurred in the past. But this is a storm like we have never seen before, too. So it calls for a different thing. I tend to be one that thinks the United States needs to hang back a little bit, um, in part because we do have strategic interests. And it's not clear that we have a strategy that if you become a reactive nation and a reactive presidency, you can be drawn into things that can have, be, have enormous consequences. And we need to let this be about the people and their aspirations and where they're going to take it. But I really appreciate the time uh, you, you shared with us. I want to thank the Middle East Task Force uh, at the New America Foundation for putting this on. There are many watchers online watching this live and who will watch it later from the Washington Note, from New America Foundation, the Palestine Note, lots of other websites that are watching us. Hopefully, we'll make Al Jazeera. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, please, please extend a very warm uh, thank you to Eamon Mahadeen for his great work at Al Jazeera. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Thank, thank you so much. Real pleasure. Thank you, Darren.